Thank you very much. Thanks, Rashid, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, I've spoken at a fair few of these things, and as a, a general rule of thumb, most of the ladies in the room have either got a Tangle Teaser or most certainly have heard of Tangle Teaser, and most of the guys in the room have either heard of it because they've got kids or um, their girlfriend's got one or they maybe caught the Dragon's Den show uh, or I just get blank looks. Um, I don't know if that's the case today, but in terms of why I'm here and why the, uh, the guys here very kindly asked me to come and talk to you, um, I've put a few slides together. Um, starting with why I've actually been asked to, to come and try and share some of my learnings and my, uh, the challenges we've faced along the way uh, with a brief introduction to the Tangle Teaser story. Um, so uh, have most of you heard of Tangle Teaser as a brand? Um, it's effectively a small plastic detangling hairbrush. Um, now a hairbrush has been a hairbrush for a long time, 100 years or, or more. Um, Tangle Teaser came along with a specific um, idea, the specific goal was to detangle hair, nothing else. Um, and in doing so, uh, when the Tangle Teaser was launched in the end of 2007, uh, around about the same time, uh, the founder, a lovely guy called Sean Pulfrey, um, he pitched his idea on Dragon's Den. Um, he was roundly rebuffed inside 15 minutes. Uh, he walked off the show, he was told it was not a business, um, it was to get back to the drawing board, no one would ever buy one. Um, and it was, I think, a harebrained idea, and uh, they would tear their hair out working with him and all this sort of stuff. And Tangle Teaser since then have sold more than 45 million units, so they can't get them all right, I guess. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the, the story of, of, of as to why I'm here. Um, so as I said, Sean, Sean pitched his idea in 2007. Um, I met Sean in 2010. He'd had two full years of trading. Um, I met him completely by chance at a, um, of all things, a Sage software seminar uh, up in Birmingham. Uh, my background is all finance and accountancy. His is very much hair, uh, hair colouring. He was a very successful hair colourist with Vidal Sassoon. Um, and it was, we're very different personalities. He's very uh, ideas driven. I'm far more finance, numbers, process, all that sort of stuff. So it worked well. Um, there's a few points on there. So in 2010, uh, we had sales of, uh, or we, the, the financial year ended with sales of uh, £800,000. Um, I came on board at the end of 2010. Um, we had the business valued at the time at half a million pounds. Um, in the space of five years, five and a half years, we grew revenues to 29 million, um, and the business was valued at between 160 and 200 million. So. We did okay. Um, the growth was exponential. The units, uh, everything was manufactured in the UK. Um, I can come on to, to, to that later in terms of how important that was to us as a brand. Uh, we were very much a great British brand. Um, <clears throat> it helps enormously um, in Asia in particular um, because they associate that UK manufacturing as a sign of quality. Um, we grew distribution from uh, the effectively back in the day, boots, and a, and a few other premium retailers in the UK, uh, plus salons was a, was a huge route to market for us. The route into the salons gave the brand and the product credibility as to why people would then buy it on the high street. Um, we grew distribution from 2%, sorry, overseas sales from 2% to 82% in that same period. Uh, we had distribution in 70 countries on every continent. Um, and along the way, we picked up two Queen's Awards. We picked up one for Enterprise, uh, and we picked up one a couple of years later for International Trade. Um, we had multiple Fast Track placings. We were on Fast Track, uh, which is a Sunday Times league table which monitors the 100 fastest growing companies in the UK based on an annual average growth rate over three years. And we, were, um, we made the Fast Track listings for four consecutive years. Uh, we're on profit track, international track, so on and so forth. All the while, whilst we were doing this, we maintained uh, industry-leading profit margins. You know, the bottom line margin, the bottom line goal was 30% plus. Uh, and when you're doing all of these things and hopefully spinning all the, the right plates and stuff, um, and in particular making those league tables, then the private equity world and, and the like start to take notes and uh, we'll begin circling um, now, in terms of building a brand and building a business, when I think back to 2010 when I met Sean, <clears throat> um, it was just he and I in a teeny tiny office, probably twice the size of this stage. Um, and we would unpack boxes, we would repack boxes. Um, I'd try and do the finances of an evening while Sean was packing web orders that, we, that had started to, to grow a little bit. Um, 
we had, or he had at the time, uh, no business plan. Uh, so I know the intro starts with, you've got your business plan, you've got your idea, blah, blah, blah. I, I suspect most people don't have the time or the expertise uh, or the knowledge to actually put together a three-year business plan. And if I'm completely honest, unless your, your business or your brand or whatever needs huge amounts of funding in the early days, we were, we were always completely self-funded. Um, I'm not sure it's a huge priority, which sounds a bit crazy coming from a finance type guy, but I think as long as you've got your eye on the ball, as long as you know roughly where cash is at, and again, you know, the vast majority of brand owners and entrepreneurs and stuff, they, they wouldn't know where to start putting together a, a three-year business plan or cash flow forecast or profit and loss account and so on and so forth. Um, the focus is, and you know, I've met a lot of startups um, over the last few years, and in particular at events like this, the focus is on sales, and our focus is on sales. Um, and there wasn't any real long-term strategy. Um, as I started to put a, a team in place, uh, which I did in 2011, um, then, yes, it does become more important. Um, so I think in terms of laying the foundations from, a, from an early stage, um, the cash flow forecast and working capital requirements, you, you need to know what they are from a daily basis. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, what we, we were doing back, back then was checking how much bank cash was in the bank every single morning. The first thing we do is check. You know, if you've got an idea, a rough idea of where you're going to be from a cash position for at least the next three months, then that's a huge help. Um, integral to Tangle Teaser's success uh, was our intellectual property portfolio, um, which there's a, a small diagram on there. But the three main things, if, if you can protect, if it's a product that you've got and not a service industry, if you can protect that product, my advice would be to allocate as much budget as you can in day one, you know, week one, before you go to market, uh, protecting that, protecting your intellectual property. You can't apply, for example, for design regs and patents retrospectively. Once the product's in the marketplace, it's in the marketplace. Um, we learned that the hard way with, uh, with one, one country in particular. Um, but if you can, then get it done early doors. It doesn't have to cost a fortune. You can start with EU design regs. Uh, so the three, again, you know, in case people don't know, the patent is on the actual product itself in terms of how it works. Uh, they're not that easy to, to come by. Um, design registrations are how the product looks um, and feels, and trademarks are obviously more around the name. So, for example, you couldn't launch a product called Tangle Teaser but spell the teaser T E A S E R because it sounds too much like Tangle Teaser spelt W E Z E R. Um, the next thing I did uh, in 2011 in terms of laying foundations was um, put an internal, uh, sorry, an external infrastructure in place. So. Our goal was always to go global from, from day one. Um, it took two years. I think our first overseas market was Holland. Um, so again, having the protection overseas becomes, becomes more important before you actually launch the product and go to market there. Um, I had a complete review of the business uh, as and when I could, and then changed the vast majority of the people we were working with. So I put new banking uh, facilities in place. I changed up our... Um, our lawyers uh, in terms of both litigation and intellectual property attorneys. Um, I changed accountants, stroke auditors, um, and changed all of the insurance uh, cover and all this sort of stuff uh, along the way. And purely did that because I had a good idea of where we were going to be. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I didn't, I didn't in 2011 say to Sean, OK, revenues are about a million. I think we'll get to 30 million in five years. The plan was to get to eight or nine, maybe 10. Uh, in, in the next three to four years, which we, we thought then would have been a huge success. Um, once the internal, sorry, the external infrastructure was um, sorted, uh, which I knew would enable the growth and we wouldn't outgrow any of the partners we were working with, um, we looked at who did what, which wasn't difficult when there was just two of us. Um, so we did everything effectively. But Sean's time was not best spent unpacking and repacking boxes of, of hairbrushes. Sean needed to be in a position where he's continually innovating, coming up with new ideas, coming up with new products, coming up with new designs. Um, and we started to put a team in place that would do all of the back end stuff, if you like. Um, you know, we started with a, a finance team. Um, we uh, recruited into logistics and, you know, fast forward five years and we'd, we went from two to 52 staff, I think they were in uh, 2017. Um, so the management team, was in place, the same management team was in place from 2011 through to 2016. Um, and I think getting that, getting that right played a huge part in, in the growth. Um, 
in terms of trying to lay the foundations in terms of what needs to be done in, once you've got those people on board, we found that setting realistic goals um, was the, the next thing that was important and not, not trying to focus on too many things all at the same time because with us being self-funded as well, we could only really effectively recruit into different positions as and when we could afford it. I've used the quote a number of times in terms of you know, surrounding yourself with rock stars as soon as you can afford to is, is really important. You know, employ people who are better than you at what they do, I think is, is uh, good advice. Um, another huge, importantly, part for, uh, part for us was the brand positioning. So we always positioned brand Tangle Teaser, um, and it was very much about the brand as well. It wasn't just a product. Uh, the brand positioning was huge. I don't know if anyone, any of you guys have ever heard of Cool Brands, but it's a publication that's published every year, and it's effectively the 100 coolest or the 70 coolest brand, worldwide brands um, that I think are on sale in the UK. And I, th I don't think they've done one this year, but uh, Tangle Teaser has had cool brand status for six consecutive years, and that, that really helps as well in terms of the positioning of the brand. We said no to mass so many times that they stopped asking, and just, you know, and when I say mass, I'm, I'm talking some of the big grocery stores, um, Superdrug. We, we steered clear of any, any retailers uh, that we thought might discount the product. Um, we started the, with the original Tangle Teaser, was a £10 uh, hairbrush. And I think if you don't manage your brand and manage the positioning of, of where your product's on sale, uh, in particular online, we had a tiny online presence because trying to monitor online discounting on a daily basis is almost impossible. Um, so we always stayed premium. We, we were on sale in uh, John Lewis, in Selfridges, in Space NK, um, Hamleys and, and the like, Boots. Um, and we always steered clear, uh, certainly in the early days of the, of the big four grocery stores, um, you know, Superdrug, uh, any, any of those sort of places. And also in terms of not just internally putting the right people in place, but at this point we, we'd made the decision to go down the distribution model as opposed to going direct with subsidiaries around the world. Um, and finding the right overseas distributor is just as important as uh, in recruiting the right internal people because we very much treated them as internal people who just happened to be based in Munich or um, the States or Japan or, or wherever. And being first to market is the last thing. If, if you've got a product where we were very fortunate that we created a whole new category in hair care, uh, called detangling. If you've got every single top hairbrush brand in the world now, they have a detangling brush in their range. But being first to market in a market that you've created was also very important. We didn't want to end up being a challenger brand uh, in any of the markets that had detangling brushes um, in their range. How am I doing for time, Rashid? Okay. <laughs> no, I've got a few more yet. Uh, culture um, played a huge part um, in the success of Tangle Teaser. I'm a massive fan of the whole uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast um, thesis. Um, I think people work for people, not for brands. Uh, I think people rarely leave a bad brand. They, they most of the time would leave a bad boss. I've had great bosses in the past. I've had some pretty poor ones. Uh, I learned more from the bad bosses than I did the good ones in terms of how not to be when you're trying to run a business. Um, I think the importance of open communication is, can't be um, stressed enough. Um, I think the importance of relationships, you know, yes, there's reporting structure in place. We had a relatively flat management structure. Um, you know, nobody told anybody effectively what to do from, on a micromanagement type scale. I think trying to maintain that culture gets harder. I think there's, there's an inevitable dilution of the culture as the brand or as your business grows. So when there's five or six of you in the team and you work hard every day and maybe grab dinner once a week or something like that and you know, morale is high, that becomes more difficult to maintain when there's 50 plus people in the business. Uh, it, it just becomes impossible. Um, you know, I think motivation is a, is a big key part of this as well. I think morale, you know, morale was always very high there. Uh, we had no staff turnover at all pretty much for the first four, four to five years. Um, we're big believers in empowerment, um, recruiting the right people, then letting them do the job, being there, being there to support them, being on hand, uh, giving constant feedback, whether that be good feedback or constructive criticism as and, as and when need be. And that works both ways as well. You know, I, I don't think anyone was afraid to sit down and tell me, I don't know, 
not that this would ever happen, that I didn't know what I was talking about or I didn't know anything about hair extensions or so on and so forth. And I think, you know, listening to, to the team, listening to the staff and listening to your distributors, if you go down the distribution model, is um, really important. Um, we put in very early on um, a, a structured performance appraisal framework. So people, anybody that joined ideally knew they had a career path at Tangle Teaser. Um, they knew that they would, um, you know, we would always try and promote internally uh, when we could. Uh, and obviously you can't always do that. And as, as we grew and become a little bit more corporate, um, that wasn't quite possible, but it was, you know, I can't, I can't personally, I can't stress enough how important culture, the culture at Tangle Teaser was to the, to the growth. Um, <clears throat> the next point I was going to pick up on was knowing your market. Um, who is your customer? Now, now we couldn't afford um, the what can be very expensive um, surveys that lots and lots of companies out there will go and do for you and do questionnaires and approach the market and all sorts of stuff. We would go to trade shows and Sean and I with the team would physically sell the brush to the customer at the trade show and constantly just talk to, talk to your customer and talk to your consumer. Um, and then, and then as we got a bit bigger, we did get some of the surveys done. So, you know, we knew that our core demographic was a 16-year-old <clears throat> to 28-year-old female. Um, and then we come on to marketing and what, what approach is best for you. Um, again, I don't think there's any one fast, right approach to, to marketing. We, we did a little bit of a process by uh, process of elimination. Um, but, you know, I think knowing the customer is really important. Knowing, you know, what design would appeal to the right customer was very important to us. Um, and that also applies, I think, to doing business overseas. So when you have distribution in 70 countries, I think it's easy to assume that people in China do business the same as, as, as you will do in London or people in India will do business the same as you would do in America. And they're all very, very different. Um, and I think doing a bit of research before you go out there and, and talk to distributors or, or even engage, you know, some, some um, cultures and, and, and countries will be more than happy with um, Skype calls, for example, whereas uh, there's, there's other distributors we had there that would almost insist on face-to-face -face meetings and not phone calls and all this sort of stuff. So I think it's important to do a bit of research before you actually enter a marketplace. Um, Innovation is critical. Um, I think. I think if we, you know, we didn't get it, we didn't get it all right. We um, we were slow for a couple of years on detangling innovation, and uh, I think that caught us napping a little bit. I think constantly becoming, constantly staying relevant and current is very important. Continually innovating. They're, they're not all going to be right, uh, but if you're not afraid to make mistakes, then you'll never do anything original anyway. Um, and if if possible, I think organic word of mouth um, goes a long way. We were, again, very fortunate in that we had um, a number of celebrity endorsements that we never paid a penny for because, quite frankly, I couldn't afford to, to pay them. But they'd, um, you know, I think that, that went a long way for, for Tangle Teaser as well. Um, one of the uh, things I, we, we were talking about before I came in today was the, the whole work balance, uh, work-life balance, sorry. Um, and I was saying to Rashid, there's a couple of stats on now, I was saying to Rashid, because a lot of people in the room now are going to be employing millennials, and I think the mindset has changed a little bit. I was um, talking to some uh, the, our German distributors just before I came here, and saying, you know, back in the day in a finance department, the first week of each month would be spent putting together the previous month's financials. And if the board meeting was at 9 o'clock on a Friday, and I hadn't got the numbers done by 3 a.m. on the Thursday, then I wasn't going home effectively. But I think that mindset has changed a little bit now. I think we always try to... Um, encourage a nine to five where possible work type place uh, work sorry work ethic at Tangle Teaser and if people needed to work from home um, occasionally then then you work from home that becomes a huge trust issue I think more and more people are doing that now but I think trying to find the balance <clears throat> um, is important but I also think that if any of you guys have just started a business um, and in particular if you haven't but you're about to at that point when it's your brand when it's your business that work life, that, that life is your work almost. I think it's, it would be naive of me to stand up here and say, just find a 50-50 work-life balance. In the first year, two years, it's not going to happen. You'll live and breathe and eat and sleep that brand. And you'll find all of a sudden that your family and friends are saying, you know, if you've got anything else to talk about, all we talk about is plastic hairbrushes and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> but it's all, you, it's all you do. So I think, I think what I would do if I could do things differently... <clears throat> 
I'm a big believer in that whole give it everything you've got in the first year to two years. Once you start to find the people around, um, you know, the art of delegation is a lot easier than it sounds as well. You know, giving things up and stepping back and not constantly want to get involved and do it yourself is really hard. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think the work-life balance thing is, is difficult, but I think as you do scale and as you get bigger and as, as you get into year three and four, don't try and do the 80 hours a week thing because you, you will burn out at some point and there's no questions. It's, it's not sustainable. You know, take the time off. You're still going to be checking your emails every five minutes or two or three times a day, but um, try and get that balance as, as you scale. So in terms of priorities and, um, and lessons learned over the last eight years uh, working with Sean and the team, um, we, we, I tried to de-risk the business as soon as possible. So when I first joined, we had all of the products uh, were made in one factory um, and there was one set of tools for each product. And I would literally lie awake at night worrying about this factory burning down and our business literally folding within, within weeks. Um, as soon as we could afford to, I had um, multiple, two or three different manufacturers, still all in the UK, but with a set of tools for each product based in each one of them. So contingency-wise, it just helped. It just helped me, well, it just helped me sleep. Um, you know, finding a, a bigger warehouse, for example, we, we got to a stage where we hit an actual glass ceiling in terms of We'd moved into a bigger warehouse, about 2,000 square foot. Uh, we were in a self-storage, access self-storage building for years. Um, and because we could only store so many products in there, we couldn't unpack and repack more than X amount per week. And we hit sales, hits a max. We were at 1.4 million a month, I think it was. And the orders were backing up and up and up and up. And lead times were going from a week to 10 days to two weeks. And it, you, you end up just creating more and more problems with part packing orders, you know, splitting orders, all this sort of stuff. Um, and we eventually moved, we found the right, the right facility and moved to a 40,000 square foot, um, you know, state of the art type warehouse that we got all fitted out. And within eight weeks, revenues had gone from 1.4 to 2.3 per month. And the lead time came down from, um, we hit a, a 28 day lead time in a run up to Christmas 14, I think it was. And that came down to 48 hours within two to three months. Um, that made a huge, huge difference to the business in terms of bottlenecks and you know, how, how we operated as, as a team. Um, I think setting smart objectives, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and you know, time-bound objectives for the business, not just for individual people, not just for a team, but for the business is important. We, we went through a couple of years of trying to do 100 things at once and you don't end up getting 50% of those things done. Whereas in the latter couple of years, we focused on trying to achieve three, four, maybe five things per year and making sure we achieved each of those each year. We made loads of mistakes. Um, I'm not going to talk about them all, but we did make mistakes, but we tried to learn from them. Um, and sometimes we made the same mistake twice, but you know, we, we, we tried to make sure we learned from those mistakes. I, I, you know, my advice would be not to be afraid not to be afraid of, of making them. Uh, sometimes it's gut feel, and sometimes that gut feel is right, and we, and we operated that way for a long, long time. Um, I could spend another half an hour talking about grey market and parallel importing and all this sort of stuff. This is, this is purely, I guess, if you're selling an actual product. We were extremely um, selective with our distribution model. We had one distributor per country which effectively meant that every dime that those guys spent on marketing and advertising and trade shows and everything for, for our product, they would reap the rewards. Um, but because of that, and because we were very choosy with the, uh, some of the UK websites that we supplied, these guys will, will source your product from the grain market if they can. Um, and that is just an ongoing, uh, an ongoing battle that Sadly, if you've got a product is that people that the consumer wants is just something that you'll you'll just have to try and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, as is battling counterfeiters. Um, the very first time a counterfeit tangle teaser rocked up on my desk, I literally nearly had a complete meltdown. Um, this is in 2011. I wanted to jump on a plane to China, find the actual producer, and just have it out there. And then uh, you can't you can't do that. I think as you get bigger and bigger. It's a war, and you're going to win some battles, and you're going to lose some others. If you try and take every single counterfeiter 
uh, the counterfeiting operation down, you'll be bankrupt in six months anyway. So pick and choose the battles. Uh, we spent a lot of money putting the intellectual property in place. So to then not enforce it was just seemed silly to us. So we, we were quite quite no no tolerance, sort of zero tolerance on, on um, battling counterfeiters and the stuff. But I think that's important. I think you get a lot more buy-in from your distributors when you take that approach as well. Uh, I touched on this before, but listen to the customer, listen to the distributor. So if, if your customer's screaming at you for something and you're constantly giving them something else, you, you, you're not making the, the best of uh, that situation, I don't think. I've touched on the make work-life work balance um, more of a priority. And again, uh, we could talk about this for a, a, another 20, 30 minutes, but if, if your plan is to exit at any point, and when I say exit, not necessarily just hand the, keys, hand the keys over to somebody, but take a minority investment, take a majority investment, sell to trade, um, then don't... We never ran the business for exit. We nearly took investment in 2016, which is where the valuations came from um, before. Don't underestimate the uh, huge amount of work involved in, in taking your brand, your company to market, if that's the route that you go down. It can be a huge distraction. It's a massive resource um, on staff, on personnel. Um, and I think just taking the right approach and, and taking the time to understand just how difficult that process can be. It can be worth it, of course, once you get there, but um, and whatever you do, don't IPO. But um, you know, if you do go down the exit route, then just be prepared for how much of a distraction that is from the business, because we took our eye off the business for three to four months uh, whilst we worked on the investment process, and uh, it took its toll. It really took its toll. Um, and I'm going to finish with, uh, I'm sure you've all seen this, but it, I, every time I see it, I think of how true it is. Um, this iceberg illusion of success in terms of what people see is just the very tip of the iceberg. And what people don't understand is all the things that have to go on below there to get, to get that to happen. Um, but as, as business owners, as startups, as brand owners, then um, you know, you'll, you'll all be more than aware of dedication and the hard work and failures and the sacrifices, lots of sacrifices at times, um, and the persistence and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much me. Thanks very much. because I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions, so I'll just get you a, um, a mic. We're going to get a, a chance to take a few questions. And I've got one on as well. Oh, you've got one on. Oh, no, I'll, I'll have this one. Well, what was really interesting for me, there were so many, there were so many things that struck me. I was writing copious amounts of notes. I was writing copious amounts of notes, and um, first of all, the first thing that really struck me was just the, the serendipity of the meeting with Sean. Yeah, yeah. Was that serendipity? Because it sounds as though you both needed each other to make this thing for work. He was somebody who understood the industry and you were somebody who was far more bus business-like. Was, was it serendipitous? Yeah, I think so. I, mean, I'd, I'd, um, I was at an accountancy software seminar. and I'm, I'm literally, it's the last place Sean would ever, ever rock up to, but he'd been asked to go and basically tell the world that Sage is the reason that Tangle Teaser did what it did. Um, I happened to be there just looking at new software and we got chatting over lunch. There'd been some, there was a little bit of common ground. So he was just stood on his own with a plate of finger sandwiches and I felt a bit sorry for him because he's in a room with 300 accountants. Um, there was a bit of common ground. My brother had just started working with Theo Bafitas on a startup, um, who's their e-com director for Boo Avenue. And Theo was one of the people that had told Sean that his idea was a bit crap and would never work. And I approached him and just said, I saw you on the den. You know, how's the business doing? And he just kept saying, we're busy, it's so busy. I was like, no, I'm sure it is, but you know, how are sales? You know, is it profitable? How's cash? You know, and he's like, it's just so busy. And I thought, God, this guy doesn't know. And it, it literally, you know, I was getting all, you know, um, and I said, look, that, that, you know, putting business plans, accounts, business analysis, all that sort of stuff is what I do. If you ever want a hand, um, you know, give me a shout. And he did the next day. Um, and I said, you know, I can whiz down to London. I was living up in Chester at the time, up in the northwest. I had no intentions whatsoever of relocating to London. I was a six-month-year-old baby. I was in a very secure job. Mm -hmm. Sean's business was a, you know, Tangle Teaser was a start-up. Uh, and he's your typical, stereotypical entrepreneur as well. I've been talking about one thing one minute, and then you're still talking about it, and he's talking about something else the next. Um, 
but yeah, I think, um, but we just clicked. Mm -hmm. And I think that yin and yang and that sort of, you know, the mad creator type, type thing. And he's brilliant, brilliant in a, in a room, brilliant in a crowd. Mm -hmm. He's enthusiastic, he's infectious. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the more pragmatic, sort of process-driven, thinking ahead type combination just worked. I, I can't help but just want to ask a quick question on that before we, we take a couple of questions from the, from the floor. Do you think that, if, as you look out at the audience, the chances are there's going to be quite a lot of people who have that passion. They've got a particular skill in their particular field. But the funny thing about business, isn't it? It's a multidisciplinary event. You need lots of people with different skills. So what... Are you, are you bound to fail unless you've got the other person or somebody in your network who has those other skills? And what would you say to anyone who is like Sean, but then the passionate, they've got the drive, they've got something incredible that they're doing, but they need the other bit. What would be your words of advice to anyone in this, in this audience? Get me on board. <laughs> uh, no. I'm sure they'd love to. <laughs> um, no, I think early, early on, you know, Sean out, outsourced all of the day-to-day -day accounting and stuff. So he'd, you know, he'd get told when to pay the suppliers at the right time and all this sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, he's great at trying to design a new product, which is what he was doing. But then sometimes you forget to place next month's order with the factory. And then when it doesn't rock up, the easy thing is to phone the factory and say, where's the product? At which point the factory would say, you didn't order any. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. little things like that, though, that become huge bottlenecks and huge so I think if you can I don't know it's difficult I'd, personally I'd always want someone in my team who's good with numbers mm -hmm. uh, who, um, who understands the profit and loss account who understands the cash flow forecast mm -hmm. um, and then you know when I joined the, the, the business for the first three years I was their chief operating officer um, and I think having that ability to be able to spin plates to be able to get the day-to-day -day stuff done and the planning even if it's a month two months ahead done is really important. Um, and yeah, as, as the team grows or as the business grows and you bring more people on board, we kept it really lean as well. Mm -hmm. For the first few years, we were one, one member of staff per million revenue, mm -hmm. um, which sounds impressive, but it's not sustainable. Um, so I, th I, th I think it would depend on the different, on, on different organisations. But for me, I think having someone who's at least financially aware mm. is, is good. You talked about life balance. And it's and I can see even the smile. It's interesting, isn't it? You, you know, you you talk. You almost seem to say two things: that a, it's really important, yeah. um, and you've got to be mindful about it because otherwise you'll burn out, especially when you're growing. But you also highlighted that it's going to be difficult, and and to really certainly throw yourself in the early years. How did you? How have you squared that stuff? And then you talked about having a young family. How, how have you managed to do it, or what's been your relationship to that thing about life balance? <coughs> um, it, to be honest with you, I think if I could do things differently, if I could do things slightly differently, if I had my time again, I'd probably address the work-life balance a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. But you don't, especially when it's your brand. And you know, in particular, the management team there, it, that was our brand. It wasn't Sean's brand and we worked there. It was our brand. Mm -hmm. It's taken me six months now to stop tidying up the boxes in boots every time I walk past the hairbrush <laughs> section. Um, it's that serious as well. Um, it, you know, you, you're, it, it is, it's all you do, effectively. Mm -hmm. And I think early on, you know, I'd go for dinner and be replying to online queries of where's my tangle tea, or it hasn't turned up in Russia or somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, you get to the point, I think, when people are saying that, you know, you're never off your phone, you're not enjoying holidays, you're mm. working all weekends. I get that. I absolutely get it. But when it's just you or just two of you, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to say at five o'clock, you know, phone's going into airplane mode mm. and I'm, I'm just not going to work now until 9am. Mm. Um, you can be told to, to do that all you like, but I think in the first year or two years, first year where so many startups fail anyway, um, it's impossible. And I'm not going to sit here and try and pretend that it's, it's easy to just switch off because um, I think you could ask, you know, a dozen people who have been on a, a journey almost as impressive as ours um, and they'll all tell you that it's almost impossible in the early days. I think addressing it as soon as you can, though, mm. is important. I want to go to the um, to the audience, and I don't know if any of our wonderful are any of our wonderful uh, handheld roving mic people there. Otherwise, I'm going to be I'll, I'll double I'll, I'll double up. So it looks as though it's going to be me. But just as I make my way into the audience, I want to ask you one more question, um, and that's can you tell who 
who, who is likely to and who's unlikely to make it in business? Can you tell when, because when you, you must meet all sorts of people and lots of people interested to get your input. And could you describe some of the qualities of people you say, this kind of person is most likely to make something of it and these people are most likely to struggle? Um, the people or the product? Maybe a bit of both, and I I'm going to start rambling. You can, get, you can get the people... It's, that work ethic, that passion and that drive is absolutely crucial. I wouldn't work with anybody now that didn't have that. Right. Um, if the product's rubbish or doesn't work or nobody wants it, then you can have all the passion and the drive in the world. It's, it's not going anywhere. But vice versa, I think, if you've got a great product and you've got someone who's... Maybe it's a lifestyle choice mm. or it's a lifestyle you know, business... I think you need the combination, the combination of the both. And in not, not in every market, in some markets, especially if you're going into a saturated market, then it becomes more about clever marketing and, and so on and so forth. But I think as a rule, I'd probably say I've, I've been lucky enough that when I've met someone and my gut has told me that we could do something here, whoever mm -hmm. it's been, then, yeah, I think sometimes you can tell. Excellent. Let's take a couple of those questions. Then We've got a question here, and then somebody had their hand up right at the back. Um, let's make our way. And if you can make it a quick question and tell us your name, and then we can try and get at least two or three questions in. Hi, my name's Anna Lynn. Um, when you're first starting out, especially now, for example, there's so many information kind of coming at you with your research and all that sort of stuff. How do you know what's important and what's to filter out? So especially like, you know, with IPO, and uh, with uh, intellectual property and all yeah. that sort of stuff, like... It just feels like there's so much information coming at you head on. It, you don't. It, it stifles you from actually starting. Yeah, I think again, it's, it's just my point. It depends on the budget. Um, you know, no one's got an infinite budget, especially as a startup. You've got a few thousand, ten, a few tens of thousands, if you're lucky, ready to go. Unless you've taken huge funding on day one. Um, from an IP point of view, I would start for sure with UK and, and Europe, European cover. Um, if it's patentable, then patent it. If it's not, then the trademarks are important, as are the design registrations. Um, obviously, this is a, a product-led um, business, but it doesn't need to be... I think if you Google anything, you, you can end up being super blown, you know, head blown in, inside 10, 15, 20 minutes where you think you're just not going to get it done. We didn't do that. I went and spoke to <clears throat> a couple of IP lawyers in London and just said, this is the portfolio at the minute. You know, what do you think we should add? Uh, you could spend weeks and months and hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of pounds just, for example, registering 100 different domain names, um, which becomes important at some point. But um, I wouldn't try and do too many things at once because all of a sudden that's all, all you'll do. You know, we got to a point where we would spend half an hour, the first hour, then it became two hours, every single day, just taking down unauthorised listings on eBay um, because they're either grey market or they were uh, counterfeit. Um, and fast forward two years, and I've, you know, we had a full-time in-house brand protection manager who just you know, worked with all the agencies and stuff to get that done. Okay. Let's try and take two more questions here. Hi, uh, my name's Rachel. I just wanted to challenge you on one of the things you said, if that's okay. I'm a bit stuck on this dilemma of to business plan or not to business plan. Yeah. And it seems that people who are successful, there are lots of people out there who are successful without a business plan. You hear these stories, and then you hear 50% of businesses fail in the first year. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if it's more luck than judgment, people who are successful without a business plan, and if, if that's sort of sensible advice. To um, go ahead I'd, without a business plan. I think, I think there's a difference between knowing what you're going to do. So, for example, if you're going to go and talk to the bank about, um, and none of them want to talk about overdrafts anymore, they want to talk about invoice um, factoring and all that sort of stuff. But if you're going to go and talk to the bank, they'll expect you to have something. Um, but I, what I meant was I wouldn't waste too much time trying to have a three- or four-year business plan um, in year one because you've got no idea. I had no idea... Um, you know, in year two, whether the following... I had, a, I had a gut feel, but we never got hung up. We never got, you know, our board meetings for Sean and myself for the first two years were a coffee across the road um, where we'd, we'd talk about the state of the business and wouldn't be talking about in September 18 now, you know, God, I think we're going to struggle to hit budget in April 21 or something like that because it's irrelevant almost, especially when you're at that startup stage. But I do think if you've got the just the current year plan where... There's, you know, if you've got a plan where you think you're going to be turning over 
50 grand a month, 100 grand a month, and then that generates cash of, of you know, that sales of X generate cash of Y, and you know that you're only doing 40 to 30 grand a month, you're going to run out of cash at some point. So I'd never say, so if that's why it came across, don't business plan at all. But I wouldn't get too embroiled in trying to put together a four or five year business plan in year one. I think if you've got an, an idea of where you need to be at the end of year one, that's, that's a big start. Two questions, and so if you give us a question, I'll take Thanks. one more question. I'm going to take a question over this side because I've got to be balanced out. So. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm a student from Loughborough University. My name is Joe. Um, I'm quite interested in a later stage question. Let's say, has the business growth? There will be non executive committee on the board <laughs> and the executive, let's say, CEO, CFO. How would you balance the balance of interest when it comes to decision making? At board level? Yes. Uh, let's uh, say uh, dividend. Uh, and the end of the year, there will be dividend for shareholders. How would you balance your funding decision like that? I think, I think uh, the payment of dividends is, is entirely up to you know, the board, board level. Normally, the CEO and the chairman, I guess, would make that call. Um, we didn't really start having serious, serious board meetings with a, a CFO, um, you know, myself, Chairman, Sean, we didn't start having those properly until 2017. Up, up until then, it was very informal. It was Sean and myself would effectively go, go, go out and, for coffee or something in the morning, and then I would come back and filter the relevant bits and pieces to my management team, who would then filter that down. I think the cascading of the, that information is really important. But, I mean, you're, I think if, you, if you're worrying too much, as a startup, if you're worrying too much about really formal board meetings where you're talking about dividends and, and this and that and the other. You know, I didn't worry about that for a number of years. Okay. Very quickly, a last elevator pitch style question and answer. Hi, my name's Leticia. Just a quick question. When approaching premium buyers, do you have any tips that you can share to get your products in these kind of uh, shops? Persistence, 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 because most of them are going to say no at first. Um, we tried all manner of um, of ways to get into some of the American um, premium retailers, which is incredibly difficult. Um, but UK-wise in particular, sometimes it depends on the buyer. So, you know, we approached Space NK, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of the brand where this actually happened. It might have been Selfridges. But the previous buyer had never heard of Tangle Teaser and wasn't too interested. That person moved on. The new person was one of Tangle Teaser's biggest fans and couldn't wait to get us on the shelf. But I think that constant persistence, not giving up, um, and even working with some difficult, you know, there's some difficult customers out there. Amazon can be really difficult to work with. Um, but you need a presence on Amazon, ideally, because if you don't, they'll source the product elsewhere anyway. I hope I don't get sued for saying that. <laughs> but yeah, persistence in terms of, in terms of um, opening doors to the, to the premium retailers. I also think a, a bit of advice, if you're talking to premium retailers, by the way, and you're already in the low-end retailers that will discount, the premium guys won't, won't be interested. Okay, thank you so much. I can't believe how quickly time's gone. Matt, I just want to thank you so much for the story. Yeah. And the, the one question we thought we were going to get, we didn't get, isn't <laughs> no, it? So no, what no. I, can you very quickly, can you share with us or do you have to kill us if you tell us what no, you're doing no, now? No, no, what, so, uh, no, so the, the, the most common question I get, I think, is um, why did you leave? Um, and I left uh, because it was, time to, it was time to do something else. I've been with Sean seven and a half, eight years. Um, and my brother was constantly on at me to join We Will Be Kings. Um, and the time just felt right early this year. Um, I spent a lot of time in 2017 putting a new management team in place, putting a chair, uh, bringing a chairman on board, an extremely well-revered chairman on board. And um, felt it was time to step down and let someone else have a crack. And enjoy the work-life <laughs> balance. Well, thank you. Um, a huge round of applause for Matt Lund. Thank, thank you so much. much.